insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 37. Dude, where's my ride? (laughs) I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my brilliant and insightful co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, sweetheart? I'm doing wonderful. How are you, dear? I'm doing fantastic. So we have quite a full show. We Um, do. Yeah, when you talked to me early in the week about it, you didn't, you seemed to suggest it wasn't that full. Well, what was kind of funny was up until yesterday, I had like one thing and that was it. And I'm like, yeah, everything exploded all at once. Everybody, yeah, everything kind of exploded at once and went, oh, we actually have something to talk about. So in our Disney detective, we will be talking about uh, over $20,000 in attraction parts uh, being stolen from Disney World. Then we'll talk about some news with the Little Mermaid uh, live movie coming out. Then uh, some Disney Plus uh, series information before we move on to our entertainment news with... uh, Uh, Our friend Samuel L. Jackson responding to some criticism. Uh, Then we'll talk about uh, Animaniacs news. Uh, Yeah, I know. I was never a big fan of that (laughs) show. I know, I know. And then Dwayne Johnson is in 12 other movies again. Um, (laughs) I swear, he's literally the hardest working man in Hollywood. (laughs) Sure is. Like, he's in five movies a year. Yeah, if that. Maybe Um, more. Then we have some local movie news with uh, Mark Hamill filming uh, in our neck of the woods in New Jersey here with a new movie. We'll have a brief in memoriam and then we will finish up with our insightful picks of the week. So very full show today. Ready to get into it? Let's do it. Go for Disney Detective. So this was kind of a I guess a funny story, but not really. So Walt Disney World has reported that $20,000 worth of pieces to a pair of Magic Kingdom attractions have gone missing from their storage area. Last week, a Disney employee noticed that a set of sails used on the high-flying Peter Pan uh, ride were gone in the storage shed that's held behind Epcot's test track. And then while he was doing... The inventory counts. He also realized that um, a shell from Space Mountain was also missing. Uh, Disney had declined to provide any more information on what the shell was used for uh, on the ride. Um, The materials attendant contacted the planning manager, who then notified the sheriff's office the following day. None of the items have any unique markings or serial numbers, so it's going to be kind of hard to to find, I guess. Um, It was a mystery as to how, you know, the theft occurred and, you know, the products left. Because you're figuring it's not like it's something you can just put in the, you know, in your pocket and walk out. We're talking, you know, big, massive, 12 foot sails, you know, the sails and and the shell of of the ride. Uh, So, you know, the items were in a padlock storage area and fencing around the shed. Uh, was also there, according to the report. So a Disney spokeswoman declined to comment, calling it a law enforcement issue. Um, The black market for rare Disney items is a very lucrative one. Um, There's actually, you know, if you look on eBay at at any given time, there's usually always something, you know, a park piece of a park ride or a a costume or something. There's even, uh, you know, a company um, that's outside of Orlando um, that that sells, you know, used 
you know, things and, you know, you kind of always wonder how they, they get some of them. Um, you know, just this past May, a former Walt Disney World cast member was arrested after entering a restricted area in Disney and stealing and reselling over $7,000 of items from the Haunted Mansion. His arrest warrant uh, also detailed facts behind the missing buzzy audio animatronic that was also stolen back in December, as well as the audio the audio animatronics missing clothes which were sold for eight thousand dollars on ebay so obviously if you look on ebay <laughs> we'll see in like, this is right, where you so, might find the guy so who just took a it. couple of things on this one like first of all they estimated those twenty thousand dollars now is that right. twenty thousand dollars the material cost of it or is that twenty thousand dollars what they think it's going for i'm guessing it's probably the material costs for you know and both of those my second things. point is it's stolen property how right. can you sell it on ebay if it's stolen property right and that's the thing is as soon as somebody tries to sell it online or right. like there has to be a black market for this there, stuff to right buy it. exactly there, ebay would not be the black market right, i would exactly. choose to do and, that and with. that's the thing is it, it says you know that there is a black market for you know like there are people that get their hands on, you know, various Disneyana yeah, of and, some sort. Yeah, and sorts, that's no different than, know. like, the black market for art smuggling true, or, true. you know, antiquities or whatever. Right. You just don't list it on eBay. You right. know, if someone and, doesn't steal the Mona Lisa and put it up on eBay. <laughs> right. Well, well, you know, it'll be interesting to see, you know, if this surfaces. And the other thing, too, is... Disney didn't have any cameras or, or anything. Well, see, and given the sheer size, I mean, just talking the sales from the right. right, just given the sheer size of these things, you can almost bet it was probably an administrative screw-up somewhere where stuff was being moved. Maybe. It wasn't documented properly. Right, and somebody right. went to look for the stuff where it originally was and it wasn't there. Yeah. So yeah. this, because I can't imagine somebody walking, because you have to come in with a tractor trailer to get these out. Right, right. And yeah, nobody would notice that. and it's not like you can just that. carry it. Right. Or put it in like a little box and just, right. you we're, know. We're talking about fiberglass shells of right. sails that are 12 foot by 12 foot roughly. Right, right. You, you're not picking these up by hand. No. You know, you're using a forklift or something to put these on a <laughs> flatbed to take them out of there. And I can almost guarantee you it's probably just an administrative screw up on Disney's part. Well, I guess we'll we'll find out if there's more that come out afterwards. Yeah. Should be interesting. Yeah. So tell us about The Little Mermaid Live. So not to be confused with The Little Mermaid movie that they're doing so there were actually two little mermaid projects that they're kind of doing at the same time one is the movie that hasn't started filming yet that's you know coming out i think later next year or the year after but then they're doing little mermaid live which is actually going to be on television um so abc's upcoming live staging of the little mermaid has added Amber Riley to the cast. Riley will appear as the MC uh, for the show that will present the Daughters of Triton with a special performance for King Triton and his subjects. Um, the rest of the cast includes, and I had to write her name phonetically because I knew just looking at it I was going to screw it up and I'm probably going to still screw it up, but it's Aulili, I'm sorry, Ali E. Cravajo, who she actually is Yeah, the, I couldn't even help you out with that one. <laughs> she's actually the actress that did the voice of Moana. Oh, okay. So that's nice. who so she has a beautiful singing voice. Absolutely. So yeah. she's actually going to be playing Ariel, then Queen Latifah is Ursula, Shaggy is going to be Sebastian, John Stamos is Chef Louis, and Graham Phillips is going to be Prince Eric. Um, Riley obviously is best known as um, uh, one of the stars of Glee. She has also previously performed with L Queen Latifah in NBC's live version of The Wiz. Um, she's been on Broadway. Um, she was actually in one of the seasons of Dancing with the Stars and, and won. Um, she's been in Dream Girls, one of the revivals uh, with that. So, you know, she has a, a fantastic voice. Um, so The Wonderful World of Disney Presents The Little Mermaid Live will be airing on November 5th. So just around the corner. And I actually saw a commercial for it on, on television, you know, just last night. So. so is the live version they're coming out with on ABC a promotional thing to get no, interest in the movie? I don't think so. I think they were kind of two separate 
So then what's pushing the revival of Little Mermaid? Is it an anniversary coming up? Probably. Okay. I don't know. I, uh, that's why. And I think that was why, like, there were so many conflicting stories when, you know, a news about the movie was coming out and who was going to be playing. So, like, you know, Jenny McCarthy playing Ursula right, and, and whatever. Right. So it was kind of like, so this sounds more like this is going to be more of a musical right. where the Little Mermaid movie coming out might not be as much of a musical as so as no, this, this is. is just a one-time live mm-hmm. performance yeah not just doing like they've done broadway or anything no like just that. like you know they've done with greece and right. they did you know well i mean they've all been on broadway right right so i guess my question is this isn't kicking off a broadway run or anything like that not that i know of no okay cool so Disney Plus uh, has announced uh, a docu series that will be coming out. We have some details on that, right? So this is actually one that that definitely piqued my interest. So according to Variety, Disney Plus has ordered ten one-hour episode episodes of a docu series entitled Behind the Attraction. The series will actually take viewers into the history of how popular Disney attractions and destinations became to be and how they changed over time and how fans continue to obsess over them. The series will uh, feature interviews with fans as well as Disney Imagineers and other behind-the-scenes shots. Um, It's you know, kind of one of their quintessential projects said the VP of uh, the original unscripted content for Disney plus. Um, He said that uh, best in class storytellers collaborating across multiple Disney units to, you know, pull back that rich history. It's going to be a very special uh, series Uh, behind the attraction right now. Doesn't have a debut date. So it's probably still, you know, in in process of, of being filmed. But I'm sure, as a Haunted Mansion fan, that will definitely be one of uh, the, the, you know, episodes. Um, so have they peeled back the details on this to let us know what rides are going to be detailing? No, or there's been like that? nothing. This was the only thing Because we been have out. a couple third-party right. um, DVDs. Of, docu- of yeah. documentaries mm-hmm. of people that have done the ride and stuff like right, that. Right, Various parts. We've mm-hmm. got... Yeah, we have the, a Haunted Mansion one. Um, the Disneyland one, mm-hmm. the opening in Disneyland, and then some of the behind-scenes stuff. Right, and right. We've gone in and interviewed some of the Imagineers. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of picturing it being like that. Is that mm-hmm. sort of how they're portraying it? I think it? so. And, and, you know, from what I've read, again, there hasn't really been a whole lot, you know, more teasers than, than anything else, but that's what it kind of... You know, sounds like it'll all be, you know, with probably footage from, you know, when the rides were first opening and, you know, from when they were do, you know, the scale models of them, you know, up until you know, opening this, day. It was this third party uh, DVD that we learned about the gum catcher in the mechanics of right. uh, Haunted Mansion. Yeah, so yeah. Cool stuff like that would be mm-hmm. interesting to see yeah. in there. So another reason to, you know, sign up if you haven't already. And we haven't yet. But I'm sure we will. I have no doubt that we will. <laughs> We've already decided to sacrifice Hulu in favor of Disney. Plus. Right, right. It's we a good will trade-off. <laughs> sacrifice the gods of Hulu. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all we had for Disney Detective today. Yes, that is it. And we'll be back with entertainment news. So Martin Scorsese had some things to say about Samuel L. Jackson. Well, actually, it was the reverse. Well, it was in response to things Martin <laughs> well, Scorsese said. Mar- right. Martin Scor- Scorsese had actually uh, made a reference saying, um, you know, a couple weeks back that, you know, right now all there are Marvel movies, you know, nobody's going, you know, there there aren't quality movies out there. You know, everything is a, a Marvel, you know, superhero movie. Uh, and Samuel L. Jackson kind of came, you know, to the defense um, with remarks, um, you know, coming back saying it's kind of like saying Bugs Bunny, you know, ain't funny. (laughs) Films are films. Everybody doesn't like, you know, his stuff either. You know, Uh, he said he said uh, everybody doesn't like his stuff either. I mean, we happen to, but everybody else doesn't. There's a lot of Italian Americans that don't think he should be making films about them and things like that. 
Um, everybody's got an opinion, so it's okay. It's not going to stop uh, anyone from seeing, uh, from making movies. So basically it was, you know, not everybody likes Marvel, but not everybody likes gangster movies either. So right. it, was, it was an interesting, you know, thing. That um, just sounds, you know... Awfully clean cut for a response from Samuel L. Jackson. <laughs> well, he was out on the red carpet, you know, at an event. So I'm guessing there was probably a not so clean version of, yeah, <laughs> of I his just, commentary. I expect, I, I expect more <laughs> colorful commentary from him. Yeah. So, you know, Scorsese actually had made comments while he was promoting his latest film, The Irishman, which is a Netflix crime drama um, about Frank the Irishman Sheehan and his dealings with um, various crime families, you know, as his hitman. Um, he basically said, I don't see them. I tried, you know, but that's not cinema. Uh, he told Empire Magazine, honestly, the closest I think of them as well as they're made is that the actors are doing the best they can under these circumstances. It's kind of like a theme park. Uh, it isn't the cinema of human beings trying to convey emotions, psychological experiences to another human being. Um, both, and this is Scorsese saying and that? And this was Scorsese Clearly, saying that. he did not see... <laughs> Endgame. Obviously, he did not because that was an emotional roller coaster. <laughs> totally. If there wasn't one, um, heck, the, you know, the end scene. You know, yeah. if, if you haven't seen it, we won't spoil it. But dude, that yeah. was just heart wrenching. Um, both James Gunn and Joss Whedon actually both came to the defense of Marvel movies in the wake of you know the comments. Obviously, because they've you know both directed you know right. them, but. Yeah, it, it was kind of like, why would you, you know, as a, f and I guess my thing is, why would you be a bully about it? Like, that's almost what it, it sounded like. Well, and you it, know, to me, you know, and, and I'll, or maybe not a bully, but, but no, I'll, we'll go with that thought because in this week's episode of Insights in the Teens, we had talked about this. And when people act like this, it's because they're threatened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and the fact that, Endgame came out and made so much money, broke all these records. Right, right. And Scorsese, who comes out and thinks he's making these wonderful artistic mm -hmm. movies and isn't getting a tenth of the crowd, right, he right. feels threatened by it. So I he's going to come yeah. out and attack it. Right. Just like any bully out there does. Yeah, yeah. So. But that's the whole thing is, you know, you look at, and, you know, look, look at Scorsese. He has this wide you know history of movies you know it's not like he's only made you know five movies in his lifetime he has you know this whole library of, of, of films that yes are great films but you know not everybody is into watching you know gangster movies or See, you know, mob movies but then not where, everybody is into superhero movies either so but that's where i would lodge my criticism of scorsese is that he much like other directors mm -hmm. has a very set recipe for his yes. movies and he doesn't step outside that comfort mm -mm, zone no. and that's a discredit to him as a director right the movies he makes are very good for what he's making right right but he, either he lacks the courage or the constructive, you know, fortitude to step outside of that. Right. And like, I would offer him a director's job for a Marvel movie now mm -hmm. and say, okay, you try you and come do in it. and you right. do it and right. you do justice to or it. Or the other thing, too, and, and, you know, not to say that there aren't other directors that do this, but it's always the same actors in his movies, too. Right. It's, it's you know. So it looks like it's literally the same movie right. over and over. It's like, oh, what character is, is this? Now, granted, with, you know, Marvel movies, you have to use the same actors if you're using the same character. You know, you're, you know, Captain America is Captain America, and now well, everybody until knows. Until it's the new Captain America. Until it's the new one. But then you'll have the explanation of it, but you couldn't have, you know, just a different actor. Right. Robert De Niro will probably not fit well in a Marvel movie in a probably costume. Probably not. That would be kind of funny. But, like, though. I lodged the same complaint against other directors, mm -hmm. like Tim Burton. Right. You know, there are people that swear by Tim Burton movies. But to me, they all look the same. They're all right. dark and brooding and depressing, and I like Tim Burton with movies. a little bit of comedy mixed in. But they all look the same, right? He, he M. Night definitely, Shyamalan, same right. thing. All his movies are the same thing with a twist at the end. <laughs> what a twist! What a twist! But like, that's my point. Is it's like right. 
Everybody has their niche. Right. And that's the thing. A, a truly great director doesn't have a niche. A truly great, and this is like, as much as I hate it, Last Jedi, Ryan Johnson stepped outside of his normal comfort zone to do that. Mm -hmm. And I give him total props for that. He failed miserably at it with <laughs> but, Last Jedi, but at good least job. at least he stepped out of what he normally does to do that. So right. I, I got to give give him credit for that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and Scorsese complaining about Marvel movies. Well, clearly people go to see superhero movies. Right. Maybe he doesn't. Right. But he's also like ninety years old, so. <laughs> It might not be his cup of tea. Right, right. But you got no right going on criticizing <laughs> an entire genre of clearly successful movies because you're threatened by them. Right, right. Anyway, let's talk Animaniacs. <laughs> so I was very excited about this. and That makes one of us. The, well, yeah. So uh, they are a Animaniacs, and they are making a comeback with the same voice cast that made the original such a blast. Um, yes, the poorly constructed parody... Oh, so sorry, I was just reading. Um, so the uh, Animaniacs are ready to announce a reboot on Hulu. So, of course, now that we're getting rid of Hulu... <laughs> Oh, are we going to keep it now? <laughs> I don't know. Well, maybe we'll see. We'll see when the the, the series comes out. Uh, so Rob Paulson will be back as Yakko. Um, and uh, Tess McNeil will be back as Dot. And Jess Harnell will be back as Wacko. Uh, once again, delivering his signature Ringo Starr voice parody of a character. Um, so this is really fun news, you know, for, for anybody that was a, uh, an Animaniacs fan. Um, right now, nothing has, has been in production, but from what people were saying that the art of this reboot kind of, you know, looks like the classic Animaniacs cartoons with a little bit of Ren and Stimpy type vibe of the show. Oh, cause I love that. Too. <laughs> Uh, it's best, you know, and, and that's probably for the best because a lot of kids love SpongeBob and have that, you know, zany look about it. Um, so, you know, it, it definitely looks like it's going to obviously speak to, you know, the grown-ups who watched it as kids, but obviously have, you know, something for, you know, kids of, of today. Um, I know our daughter, there's some YouTube video that they kind of take one of the, the videos from Animaniacs and kind of revamp it, and, and she gets hysterical watching it. So, you know, to be able to actually see, you know, a new version of it, you know, she might actually um, enjoy. Um, they basically said, we can't wait to work with Steven Spielberg and the entire ca uh, uh, team at Amblin and Warner Brothers um, to, you know, produce more sketches and catchphrases and songs and laughs uh, for kids and adults everywhere. Um, and this... You know, like I said, it's going to be another, you know, thing for, for Hulu, you know, because they haven't really had too much, you know, out there. But didn't Disney Plus and Hulu have like a package deal, too? Wasn't well, Disney that... owns Hulu. Right. So there so was the that. More, from, from, the, from what I've read so far, the more adult stuff is supposed to be going over to Hulu. Hulu. Right. right. So, you know, yeah. So maybe we'll have to. You know, I'm, see when it comes out. I'm kind of divided on this one. Like the nostalgic part of me is mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, it's cool. He brought bringing back something that that we loved. Some of us loved as kids. But the creative side of me is kind of disappointed at this because it's like, oh, great, another reboot. Have we absolutely no creative talent left well, to come yeah, up with something and that's, new? And that's something you know with you know with everything not just with the cartoons but with you know various movies and and things like that and you know when we talked about with uh you know terminator the new version of terminator that was basically you know wiping out you know all right. the other movies right. and and you have all these other you know movies that they're doing newer versions of or or whatever you know even television shows they they've done that too where they've yeah. You know, basically, you've got Magnum PI, you've got Hawaii Five O, right. and it's like, you know, I know the negative Nancy in me thinks that it's, you know, I, I'm 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 down on all this stuff, but right, 
I, I wish there was more creative to right. creativity and that's, out there. And that's there. been, you know, for years now that, that they've been doing that. But you the know, problem it was is, kinda... is most of these reboots usually ruin what the original was. Right, lies. right. Uh, until you go back and you watch the original, and you're like, oh, my God, did I actually watch this stuff? <laughs> See? So in some cases, um, not so bad. But, yeah, okay. I don't know. The, it, the, it the kid in me, you know, is kind of excited, you know. About seeing, you know, Animaniacs again. And, and it's been years since I've watched it. So it would be kind of interesting to go back and, and you know, find older episodes and see, you know, if they yeah. still, you know, have that same, you know, appeal. Because there are certain things that you go back and watch it, like you said, and you're like, oh, my God. That was so not funny. Like, what was I thinking? Yeah. And then there are other things that, you know, you watch and you're like, oh, my God, this is totally, you know... Yeah, like I was totally very impressed up. with Hawaii Five-0 when it came back. Mm -hmm. So I don't watch it anymore because I got bored with it. But right, right. So, so let's talk about one of the fifteen movies that Dwayne Johnson <laughs> is in this year. So Dwayne Johnson and Emily Blunt uh, will be in the Jungle Cruise, um, and the trailer for the movie actually just dropped the other day. Um, so the pair um, star in the trailer for uh, Disney's Jungle Cruise, which it, uh, they have it. It's an early 20th century adventure that follows the riverboat captain, Frank, who is played by Johnson, and a scientist um, who is played by Blunt as they venture into the wilderness. Uh, neither Johnson nor Blunt are strangers to the Disney family, obviously. He has voiced uh, Maui in 2016's Moana, and she obviously played Mary Poppins uh, in last year's Mary Poppins Returns. Uh, Jungle Cruise is based on one of Disney's oldest and most enduring properties. Uh, the original Jungle Cruise Disneyland ride opened in 1955, and and during the D23 Expo in August, both Johnson and Blunt promised an adventure that puts a new spin on the ride. Think Pirates of the Caribbean meets Indiana Jones. Um, they said that we are both so moved and honored to be in a movie like this because we grew up madly in love with Indiana Jones and Romancing the Stone, Blunt had said on stage during D23. So to be part of something like this in the same spirit makes my heart race. Uh, the film also stars Jack Whitehall, Edgar Ramirez, Jesse uh, Plemons, and Paul Giamatti. And it'll cruise into theaters July 24th, 2020. So this one is kind of interesting because, again, it's another one of these Disney rides that's been turned into a, a movie. movie. Right. Yeah. And what was kind of funny watching you know so if you go in and you watch it you know there are those you know if you've ever gone on the jungle cruise ride you know those there are those you know one-liners that they all you know no matter how many times you go on it certain puns are, are always mentioned and in the one scene they show something and they go through like three of them right and you're like okay so that's how they're kind of tying in the ride but other than that that's really you're on a it. jungle cruise you're on a jungle mm -hmm. cruise it kind of you know it was funny because before reading the article and just watching it i was thinking you know a comical jungle cruise um uh uh not jungle cruise um raiders of the lost ark something right. indiana jones ish and then it had that you know vibe of romancing the stone you know um, you know, they, they don't show if it's a romantic, you know, thing, but it, it kind of, you know, had that, oh yeah, I kind of, I think I've kind of seen this before, yeah. you know, African queen even, you yeah, know, that's, as a, that was kind of my first impressions when I saw yeah, it. Like yeah. Like the African queen, but if it was a comedy, right? you know, so it, it has that, that look about it, you know, she hires him to, you know, take her into the Amazon, you know, type thing, and and you know, so so we'll see. Should be interesting. Yeah. And Dwayne Johnson's always fun to watch. Oh, absolutely. So tell us about our filming in our backyard with Mark Hamill. So this was a, an interesting little story that popped up uh, earlier in the week. There was one uh, news outlet that had this, and uh, then uh, another popped up with a little bit more. Uh, information. So Vineland, New Jersey, and Millville, New Jersey, which are in like south 
South Jersey, if you know, if you the deep south, the deep south of Jersey, um, also happened to be where where I work. Uh, uh, the so this was kind of funny. Um, so Vineland and Millville are getting ready for their close-ups. A new feature film starring Mark Hamill and Sean Astin will film in both towns beginning sometime next week. Um, the movie is called The Retaliators. Um, filming in Vineland is expected to take place at the Palace of Depression, which... <laughs> oh, that sounds cheerful. <laughs> I was like, really? Um, and I don't even know how to... Uh, Gamma P- Pietro Park? I'm sure anybody that is from Vineland could probably tell me how to pronounce that. Um, and that was based... Um, uh, according to the Daily Journal, which is a local paper from the, the area in South Jersey. Um, sites scouting in Millville include the upper reaches of the Maurice River, which isn't too far from, from where I work, um, which was kind of funny because somebody else from from my office had posted about this as well, and I said, ooh, are we taking a road trip during lunch sometime? <laughs> so if we happen to leave the office for a couple of hours, <laughs> Or if we hear about something, we might be uh, going to see if we can find anybody. Um, So the project utilizes the New Jersey film and digital media tax credit, um, which uh, is a financial incentive for productions primarily filmed in our state. Cumberland County actually offers the state's highest tax credit incentive at 35 percent. Um, so the South Jersey Film Alliance is handling the film's locations and amenities. The SJFA is also behind a production of Army of the Dead, which is a Netflix zombie movie that's actually currently shooting in Atlantic City, also our neck of the woods. Um, which is fitting, because if you get a b- block <laughs> off the boardwalk, it does look like Armageddon. I was, I was, I was waiting for you to say that. Um, so details on the movie haven't been publicly released, um, but a representative told the Daily journal that the movie involves a man who tries to help people find justice by uh, capturing a suspected criminal. The film will also feature all five members of the metal band Five Finger uh, Death Punch. Ooh, sign me up. (laughs) (laughs) I'll have a great soundtrack on that one. So obviously Hamill is known for playing Luke Skywalker. He is. He is. We we've seen him a couple of times in I that. I thought I recognized that name. And he's also done the voice of the Joker in the Batman the Animated Series. And Aston uh was obviously known uh for Samwise in Lord of the Rings, Mikey Walsh in The Goonies, and Rudy Rudy. <laughs> From the self-titled movie, Rudy. And also, he was in last season's uh, Stranger Things as well. Wow. So, so that'll be kind of cool to to know that, you know, right in our backyard, you know, or, you know, something exciting is, is being cool. filmed. So Very cool. Yeah. That's it for entertainment news. We'll come back Shoot, with a brief, that was it. brief in memoriam. Mm-hmm. Tell us about a fallen Mouseketeer. So uh, Karen uh, Pendleton was one of the original Mouseketeers on the Mickey Mouse Club, and she unfortunately passed away from a heart attack uh, last Sunday in Fresno, California. Uh, uh, Disney historian had actually made the announcement. Uh, She was 73. Uh, Among the youngest of the kids on the show, she was known for her shoulder-length blonde curls and for being paired with fellow Mouseketeer Chubby uh, Cubby O'Brien in the show's sweetest closing number. Um, Now it's time to say goodbye to all our company. So... yeah, wow, so. nothing like taking us down a depressing <laughs> route now. Uh, she worked on the Disney series throughout its four-year run on ABC, uh, then entertained generations of children around the world for decades after it played in syndication. Uh, she was one of only nine kids who actually appeared in the program during the entire run of the original airing. Uh, she was recruited uh, recruited to audition for the Mickey Mouse Club when producers approached dancing schools in the Los Angeles area seeking kids to try out for this new show. After the Mickey Mouse Club, she left show business, finished her high school, uh, finished high school, got married and had a daughter. Uh, unfortunately, she got divorced a couple years after that. 
1981. In 1983, she was involved in an automobile accident that actually paralyzed her from the waist down. Uh, she needed a wheelchair for the rest of her life, but returned to school to earn her bachelor's and master's degree. Um, she also went on to work for a shelter for battered women and became an advocate for those with disabilities as a board member for the California Association of the Physically Handicapped. Um, her daughter said, my mom loved her Mouseketeer family. Um, getting together with her co-stars was always a high point. It gave her the opportunity to relieve, uh, relive great memories and to meet so many Mickey Mouse Club fans that had watched the show as kids and loved her. Many told her that they named their daughters Karen in her honor. Uh, she also co-starred in many uh, Mickey Mouse Club reunion shows and parades at Disneyland um, and at fan shows and convention. She is also survived by two grandchildren. And we wish the family our condolences. All right, let's uh, come back with our insightful picks of the week. To you, my dear. So, as I had mentioned last week, I was going to try and, and keep with a certain theme for the month of October uh, to keep with spooky Halloween horror type things. So this is flashback October, right? <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, last week it wasn't as old of a movie. This one is. What are so you trying doing... to say? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so this happens to be one of my all-time favorite horror movies and it is Bram Stoker's Dracula. Um, it's actually the 1992 version um, that was directed by Francis Ford Coppola and obviously based on the novel Dracula by Bram Stoker. Uh, it starred uh, Gary Oldman as Count Dracula, Winona Ryder as Mina Harker, Anthony Hopkins as Professor Van Helsing and Keanu Re uh, Reeves as Jonathan Harker. Um, Obviously, most people know the story of, you know, Dracula. Uh, Count Dracula is a 15th century prince, and he's condemned to live off the blood of the living for eternity. Uh, and the young lawyer, Jonathan Harker, is sent to Count Dracula's castle to finalize a land deal. And when the Count sees a photo of Harker's fiance, Mina, she happens to be the spitting image of his dead wife. He then imprisons him and sets off to London to track her down. Nothing like a good stalker movie <laughs> with some bats and rats and, and other things. Um, this version of, of Dracula really is a love story. Um, you know, you, you, you know, it starts off in, in the 15th century with Vlad the Impaler and you kind of, you know, find out, you know, it's obviously not historically correct, you know, in any way. Vlad the Impaler was a real person. You know, uh, when Bram Stoker wrote the the novel, he kind of based it off of legends and, and things like that and put his own, you know, twist to it. Uh, you know, so the movie starts off where, you know, he's fighting a war and he comes home and finds that his wife has committed suicide because the enemy of who he was fighting sent a letter to her saying that he had died in the war. So she didn't want to live. Very Romeo and Juliet. Right. She didn't want to live without him. So she killed herself. And then, you know, he's told, you know, that her soul will, will never be saved because she committed suicide and it's a sin. And so then, you know, he basically has a whole out, you know, holy war and basically becomes immortal from drinking blood. So that's kind of how he turns into this Count Dracula. And then again, you know, so many, you know, centuries later, Harker, you know, poor Jonathan shows up and he happens to see this picture and it's, you know, somebody that looks exactly like his wife. So, you know, in his mind, it's his wife reincarnated. Right, right. And, you know, he goes to London and he basically, you know, woos, you know, Mina 
and you know and she kind of has flashbacks of this former life so you kind of you know in the movie you kind of feel for her realizing oh my god maybe this is a, a lost love and then obviously everything kind of goes to hell in a handbag and this was the one with the the dracula makeup job that was described as a baboon's butt right <laughs> Yes, that was his okay. hair. <laughs> I just want to make sure. Yeah, I got they the right actually one. Uh, they were nominated for three Academy. This movie, this version of the movie, was a, uh, nominated for three Academy Awards and actually won Best Makeup because if you see, you know, the the various incarnations that Gary Oldman goes through as Dracula, you see him as the the warrior, the 15th century warrior. Then you see him as this, you know, 500 year old man, you know, 400 year old decrepit thing with the baboon butt right. hair and then all of a sudden he becomes this you know uh dapper uh you know the the 18th century uh you know this very well-dressed you know nobleman, nobleman you know and and you know so it's just amazing um you know makeup and, and whatnot so um some of the acting you know like keanu reeves part you know nobody, like nobody really expects Keanu Reeves to act so that's okay. <laughs> well and that's the thing is it's one of those oh it's so cute you know but it, it you know it was nice to see you know uh like you know um Anthony Hopkins you know plays a you know there are just anything with 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 um you know Van Helsing he's he's just hysterical and he's like of course I'm gonna cut off his head da, 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 and what um you know and I think for me it, it was kind of the love story part you know because the tagline of you know uh, the movie was love never dies right. so that just and the, and, and by the end of the movie can I reach like dude <laughs> where's my wife <laughs> Right, exactly. And this was actually back in, in 92. I, I was in college, and for some reason, I was just obsessed with this movie. I actually went and saw this like three or four times in the movie theater, and it was probably one of the only movies that I've I've actually, you know, ever wow. done that with. So, Well, good pick. And um, because of the Halloween season, it is going to be on, you know, regular TV, obviously, a little cut up and, you know, right. some of the language and some of the violence taken out. But I think like BBC America was going to be playing it, you know, coming up in the next uh, couple of days. So an oldie but a goodie. Yep. All right. We'll be back with my pick. So I didn't go back. Uh, in the archives for my pick this week. Mine, no. mine was uh, produced in 2019. Oh, okay. Uh, and shockingly, it's a documentary. Oh, my God. Was um, it on Netflix? It was actually on Netflix, Oh, my yes. gosh. Uh, so I'm going to go with the great hack this week. Um, data, arguably the world's most valuable asset, is being weaponized to wage cultural and political wars. The dark world of data exploitation is uncovered through the unpredictable personal journeys of players on different sides of the explosive Cambridge Analytica Facebook data story. The Great Hack explores how a data company named Cambridge Analytica came to symbolize the dark side of social media in the wake of the 2016 U.S. presidential election. And I don't want to get into the politics of this, but watching this and seeing the information that came out and how it was used, um, you could probably say that no laws were broken by certain political figures. Okay. But what was done was morally questionable or ambiguous. Okay. Um, and what was a really interesting takeaway here was that Cambridge Analytica really didn't do anything legally wrong either, even under, because they had an entity in the U.S. and they had an entity in the U.K. And the movie starts out with this one particular individual who was made to understand that his information was being, his digital information was being cataloged and indexed and used for marketing purposes. Okay. Big shocker. And... There wasn't any legal recourse he had to get this information out of the company that had it in the U.S. Then he found out about the subsidiary in the U.K., and there were U.K. laws. And he pursued those laws, 
and the company was basically ordered to turn the data over. They failed to turn the data over, uh, pled guilty in a criminal case, and then the company went bankrupt and all the assets were liquidated. So all that data was, uh, you know, no longer available. Mm. But as they dig into it, the really interesting thing about this documentary is they actually went in and interviewed people who were involved in the process, media people, executives from Cambridge Analytica, people who were literally in the trenches. Okay. And there's they establish a history of how Cambridge Analytica used multiple sources, Facebook being one. Okay. You know, they had they they bragged that they had 5,000 points of data on millions of people, 30 million people of which they were basically getting profile information from Facebook. And they had put out a questionnaire on Facebook, which was a targeted questionnaire. And that targeted questionnaire started to develop what, you know, we've all heard of, um, oh, I can't think of the word now. But what they did was they were using this to target certain individuals that they thought could be influenced in an election. Okay. Kind of like profiling. Basically. Yeah. But then the step further that they went was they then looked at these, they got permission from the people as part of this agreement for the survey to look at their friends list. Okay. Then they went and started scraping their friends pages to get additional information on those people. Okay. Now, uh, Facebook had admitted to giving access to these, but then relinquishing or, or, or removing that access. Mm -hmm. Um, and at one point in time, Cambridge Analytica had, had said that they had deleted the data Proof came out later on that they hadn't had it. They had retained the data and were continuing to build profiles. Say, of course they deleted it. You know? So the interesting thing here was they used this information to influence elections around the world. Talking like countries like Guyana, Trinidad, uh, Belize. I mean, okay. they, were, they had their hands in so many other countries around the world. And it wasn't even so much that they were trying to run campaigns. They were trying to do suppression campaigns. Wow. In one case, it was um, in Trinidad, they, and this is based strictly on what was in the in the um, movie, there in Trinidad, there is a, an Indian population and a black population, and they were both vying for political power. And they ran a campaign that encouraged the black people in the country to not vote as a means of protest. Hmm. And they turned it into a social phenomenon in the country. And just by suppressing about 6% of the black votes, they were able to swing the election in favor of the other party. Oh, wow. Um, then they dig even further and they talk about how Russia gets involved. So Russia is not directly involved with Cambridge Analytica, but Russia is made aware of some of the connections that are involved here. Okay. So then Russia then buys up millions of dollars in ads on social media like Facebook. Okay. Supporting and encouraging white supremacy. Mm. Then they wind up funneling money into Black Lives Matter, all in a push during the 2016 election to cause a race war, you know, to cause this divide. Okay. Um, and it was a divide that was fueled by the work that Cambridge Analytica was doing. Cambridge Analytica came up with the whole crooked Hillary idea. Okay. That the Trump campaign managed to contract out the Cambridge Analytica and Cambridge Analytica basically became the PR firm for Oh, it. wow. And they look at the spending and you look at, um, the Trump campaign spending something like over $600 million on mm. digital ads during the 2016 campaign and the Clinton campaign, something like 20 or 30 million. And I don't have the numbers in front of me, so you'd have to watch the, the movie to get the numbers. But it was one of those things where it wasn't necessarily against the law to do it, but it probably wasn't in the best pretty faith. shady yeah you know yeah and 
and there was a, a UK journalist who was targeted by this as well um, because Cambridge Analytica was involved in the whole Brexit deal as well, okay. pushing Brexit. They had even run uh, a third party, what we would consider a political action committee on, on our side here to basically influence the vote. <coughs> And this journalist was opposed to it because wow. she knew how it was negatively affecting the democratic process. And they targeted her to discredit her. Um, and it was just the way it was laid out in the, in the documentary was showed how blatant it was. It, okay. it, it just was undeniable. Um, and the premise of it was to show that in today's digital society, you just can't have a free and open election anymore because of how influential digital media is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in my opinion, I think they kind of <clears throat> drew the wrong conclusions here and they vilified um, Cambridge Analytica and, and some of these other bodies. But in reality, it's, it's us, the people that mm -hmm. ultimately are responsible for this because we're the ones who willingly give our data to these companies, mm -hmm. some things you can't like. You can't go off the grid. You just can't and function in society, right? Financial transactions, credit card stuff. You know, certain things you can't get away from. But the lesson that I took away from this documentary is that why would you voluntarily give people information? Mm -hmm. Answering these goofy surveys, you know, right, right. Oh, how do you get your Jedi name? And you answer all this information, and you at that point in time have become the product. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one thing they point out very good in this documentary is that, you know, th there was one um, politician during this hearing in the UK uh, who basically asked, you know, Facebook, how do you make your money? You know, how much of your money, how much of your income comes from people's data? And the answer was astonishingly, it was like 97% of, of what they do comes from people's data. Oh, wow. Um, and we have no control over it. Mm -hmm. And that's really the scary thing. You know, you've seen some things come out of this at this point in time mm -hmm. to try and control some of this stuff. But really, it was, it was a documentary about data rights. Mm -hmm. Like, you have a right to your data. You have a right to know where it's coming from, who it's being given to, what it's being used for. And you have companies like Google and um, and Facebook mm -hmm. and these other people that they're monetizing your data. And there was a point in the documentary where they talk about how your data became more valuable than oil. Wow. Your data is the number one commodity in the world now. Mm. So if there's anything to take away from this, it's keep that in mind. You wouldn't go around giving away money to people. Why would you give away your data, which is more valuable than the money that, that you spend? Um, so it was a very interesting, very eye-opening documentary. Um, and I would recommend you know anyone who operates in the digital world, which pretty much is everybody, mm -hmm. especially anyone who's listening to this podcast, right? watch the documentary and understand just where some of the pitfalls are and learn how to defend yourself in this society. So The Great Hack, streaming now on Netflix. Uh, I think that's all we had this week, right? That is. So we will be back next week with uh, another one. I don't think we have any conventions or anything between now and then. Nope. Uh, in the meantime, you can check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. You can get the video of this on uh, youtube.com slash insightsintothings. You can check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. You can email us at comments at insights into things, or you can hit us on Twitter at insights underscore things. I think that's everything. I think that is. All so right. don't give out your information. Yeah. Don't give out any of that information. <laughs> right. That's okay. We fuzz all of our data, so we're okay. <laughs> so we're all good. <laughs> All right. We'll be back next week, folks. Thanks for watching. All right. Have a good one, everyone.